Hi everyone, I'm Pranoti, host of Under the Microscope. This series is brought to you by the Real Scientists Nano team. Our goal is to provide a platform where scientists can communicate their work and interact with the public. With that in mind, every week we introduce you to a scientist working in the field of materials or nanoscience, who tweets from the Real Scientists Nano Twitter account, which is realsci underscore nano. Hi everyone, today we have with us Brian Pau, who is a researcher at BAM, Federal Institute for Materials Research and Testing. My name is Pranothi, and now we are going to take a deeper dive with Brian into his research and his life as a scientist. So, hi Brian, how are you? Hello, doing fine, thank you. Great. So, uh, could you start with, could we rather start with understanding your scientific career journey so far. Uh, where did it all begin, Brian? Well, I started out in the Netherlands. Um, I studied until my master's degree at the Eindhoven University of Technology. Um, these days, people call me a physicist, but I originally studied um, uh, chemical engineering. Mm -hmm. Now, chemical engineering is a little bit special because I found that after finishing my studies, I didn't really know all that much about chemistry or engineering, but you know, <laughs> I know a little bit of both. I did a, during that time, I, I, I did a company internship at, at Tejan Aramid, and that's, that's where I started to work with, uh, with x-rays. Um, and x-rays are, x-rays are absolutely cool. I mean, they're one of the coolest uh, forms of electromagnetic radiation that you can work with. Mm -hmm. Um, now, after that company internship, I, um, I did a master's project. And back then, I was really into computers. So I did it on computational chemistry. But after seven months, you know, I spent a whole summer sitting indoors behind my screen. And, uh, and that was, I, I found that was not quite what I wanted. So um, I kept in contact with, uh, with Tej and Aramid. And they helped me set up a PhD project um, for which I went to Denmark. So I then uh, went to the uh, DTU, the Danish Technical University, in collaboration with the Rizzo National Labs and Copenhagen University uh, and Tej and Aramid. Uh, so I had a lot of supervisors all over the place. Um, mm -hmm. I, uh, I then did my PhD on X-ray scattering on fibers because that was um, that was actually really awesome because uh, that was it was a complex problem uh, that we were working on and. Um, during that time, I really wanted to get the perfect measurements, you know, and I still don't have the perfect measurement. Uh, it's been 15 years since then, and I've, I, I'm trying. We're, we're getting closer to that, but I'm still not having the perfect measurement <laughs> or the perfect analysis for that matter. Um, yeah, so after that, I went to do a postdoc for Aarhus University, which is also in Denmark. Uh, they sent me out to live at Spring 8 in Japan. Uh, Spring 8 is a synchrotron, so one of these um, places where they produce a lot of x-rays uh, and have a lot of experiments around that, um, uh, around that electron ring. And I spent one and a half years uh, then at the synchrotron. This was in the mountains and pretty much in the middle of nowhere. Um, and I could just see my blood pressure rise all the time. I mean, the synchrotrons are stressful environments. They are sort of, they have a very... Uh, a very rapid move from one experiment into the next. All these experiments are 24 hour experiments. So to try and alleviate that, um, uh, I applied for a second postdoc at the National Institute for Material Science in Japan, uh, mm -hmm. NIMS. And um, there I could go back, in the, back into the lab and actually refine more of the data correction methods uh, that, I, that I was interested in. So I found that at the synchrotron, there was a lot of emphasis on getting a lot of data okay. uh, at very high speeds, but the data that we got wasn't really all that perfect. There was a lot of stuff, there was a lot of uh, features and artifacts which were not part of our sample in there. So, so we were measuring a lot, but we should, you know, we had to correct for a lot of these things and that was not implemented at that time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I spent three, four, five years uh, trying, to, um, trying to perfect the data correction methods, the data analysis methods in Japan in one, uh, in one postdoc, uh, which was quite long. And then after that, I got hired as a permanent researcher in Japan as well. We then moved to Berlin, uh, 
because our kid was born and went to kindergarten in Japan and we decided, okay, well, maybe Japan is not the best environment for a kid to grow up in, uh, for an international kid to grow up in, uh, in, in that sense. So we wanted to put him in a more international uh, environment. environment and what what better place to do that than than in Berlin, which is as far as, well, as far as our experience goes, is one of the more international places um, that we have that we have found. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I've been here for the last six years, pretty much continuing the same work. So they gave me an instrument at, uh, at the Institute, or they gave me a permission to buy a new instrument. Mm -hmm. And um, three years ago, that was installed. So we've been working on that and improving that and taking it apart and making new software for it and so on. So we've done a lot of work on um, on trying to improve this this x-ray scattering method mm -hmm. uh, over here as well so our our working style is that we then is that we focus on the methods and the analysis and that we invite uh, material scientists to come to us and um, uh, with their interest in materials and then we we try and take a look at it and see if this is a technique that can give perhaps some extra insight into, into this so we we do a lot of collaborations both within our institute but also outside our institute so, mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. okay wow that's quite a journey you had from netherlands to denmark to japan to now berlin germany mm -hmm. uh yeah. that is really really cool um how does it feel uh, to be called a physicist when you started off your journey as a chemical engineer? Sorry, I'm not trying to be controversial here, but I've no. been a material scientist for quite some time, and mm -hmm. uh, there is quite a bit of um, back and forth, let's say, between chemists and physicists. <laughs> I know you're a chemical yes. engineer, but um, is yeah. that okay with you, Brian? Is it yeah, of course. Yeah, no, I, I, I think in the, in the end, it it really doesn't matter. Um, whatever you study is giving you a starting point, right? And after that, you can you can go from the starting point in all kinds of direction. You can either go the more synthetic route or the more computational route or the more uh, the more physical route. And wherever you decide to go, you will always find that you're lacking in information, right? You 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 haven't got all of the knowledge necessary to to do that. Um, but that's also not what what the university is supposed to do right that's not what the master's degree is it's not supposed to give you all of the information and then and then you're done right no it's right. Uh, you essentially never stop learning you you just continue and um and find ways to get the knowledge that you need to do the to do the job that you want to do so yes. yeah absolutely yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't want to be controversial here. As I, I was just <laughs> I, wondering. I, I, I don't think uh, you're controversial. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because as a material scientist, we are always tossed between, no, you're a physicist. Oh, no, you're a chemist. Oh, no, you're an engineer, actually. So, why, why not Why not all, right? All why of it, all yeah. yeah. <laughs> I say the same thing. We are all three. Um, yeah, I, I, but it sounds really cool. I mean, coming back to your, your career journey, it sounds very inspiring. And I'm glad you have the instruments now that it's, it's been installed since three years and now you can do all yep. kinds of cool experiments. Yeah, I, I got very lucky, I must say. Uh, I mean, I, I have a lot of colleagues who also, in my eyes, should, deserve, uh, should have deserved the same kind of luck and the same kind of success in um in getting permanent positions for example um mm -hmm. in being able uh, in being given the freedom to, to research what they want to research because if you're really if you're really enthusiastic about something uh, the research comes automatically and you don't really need to put a lot of effort into it of course there are moments that you know, things don't work uh, or that you really have to process those hundreds of data sets uh, kind of bulking against that prospect but um, but most of it comes relatively smoothly if you really like what you do. And that, of course, means that you need some freedom to do what it is that you, that you really care about. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, lucky on the one hand. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I'm also, you know, your stereotypical white male. So that, that also gives me advantages that, I, that, that others do not have. So it, I, I do speak from a position of privilege and that is, that is something also to keep in mind that mm -hmm. others may not have this privilege. That is true. 
Yeah. And Brody, I'm sure you've had your challenges as well. Um, yeah. But coming coming back to the research, uh, your current research specifically mm -hmm. at BAM in Berlin, uh, you already mentioned uh, what are you doing, uh, what what is your current research. But what I want to understand from you, Brian, is where does this your current research fit in this big picture of materials and nanoscience? Because materials and nanoscience is really broad fields. Uh, so where does your research fit in this big puzzle? Yeah, so so everything we measure is is nano, right? Uh, I mean, because our our technique it doesn't really extend that far beyond the, uh, beyond the nano world. We can measure, as I said, with uh, or as I might have alluded to already, um, with ultra small angle scattering, we can measure up to a few microns. Uh, but that's it, right? So we can uh, we can measure everything underneath. And actually, the smaller the structure is, the easier it is for us to measure. So single nanometers, absolutely no problem. Our detection limits are really low there, uh, so we can we can measure really small amounts of small particles. Um, a few hundred nanometers. That's where things get a little bit complicated and hard to measure. But we've extended our measurement range also downwards, so we can now measure things like crystalline lattices and diffraction and um, and wide angle scattering and so on. We don't go quite as far as the total scattering people, but still think it's a bit of a misnomer. But total scattering goes to very very wide angles or actually very high scattering vectors, um, and we we can't quite match that because for that you need high photon energies um, uh, in addition to measuring at uh, at wide angles and on our lab instrument, we just don't have the high photon energies to do this. However, we are collecting a lot of information uh, from that angstrom size scale to you know, nanometers and uh, up to microns. So that is all nano. And the the material scientists that comes, uh, material scientists that come to us are, um, they are interested in this nanostructure. Right, because as, as I mentioned, this really defines, uh, or this can really define the physical properties of their materials or the optical behavior of their material. Um, so they're interested in getting nanoscale insight, and we do our best to try and see whether this technique uh, um, can help them. Uh, it doesn't always work, right? <laughs> <laughs> there are. And I'm, I made a YouTube video about this, about sample selection for X-ray scattering. Um, there are a lot of conditions uh, that can sour things for us, right? Or that can make it impossible to do small angle scattering. Uh, mm -hmm. Not enough contrast between your particles and whatever it is in uh, is one of them, which is why biological systems are typically harder to measure. Uh, things like mm -hmm. proteins in solution, very low uh, contrast for us. Um, or we can have things like fluorescence happening, right? If we have uh, iron nanoparticles and we measure it with uh, with our standard copper X-ray photons, then um, we get a lot of fluorescence coming up, uh, and then we need to deal with that. So some of these things we can deal with, other things we cannot. And in many cases, it's a matter of uh, of trying and seeing. Now we are getting better at predicting whether samples make sense, and with our wide range of experience now with um, with all kinds of different materials, we can reasonably accurate prediction of, about whether we will see something useful or not. Mm -hmm. um, we still sometimes fall back and say, okay, well, we'll just uh, do a proof of principle measurement and see whether we whether it makes sense at all to do uh, to do these kinds of experiments. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. yeah. That is really, really interesting. And I'm definitely really curious to, to learn about your science <laughs> when you're <laughs> taking it with the account. Mm -hmm. It is almost like a, it is kind of a new world for me um, because, as I mentioned, extra scattering, it is a new world for me. I mean, I did some XRD back mm -hmm. in my master time, I think. Um, but yeah, that was ages ago, and I would love yeah. to learn more about it from you. Yeah, um, yeah. And this is, this is also where the history gets interesting, right? Because it is it has existed for more than 100 years, X-ray scattering. Mm -hmm. um, and I can bring up some of the uh, I can bring up some of the earliest examples in uh, in my week cu curating this account, but um, but I find that it's only over the last uh, 15, 20 years that we've been able to um, to really dramatically improve on the technique uh, and on the reliability of the technique, and that was in no small part due to uh, amazing developments in detector technology. Um, 
uh, availability of more and more computational power that we can actually uh, correct for pretty much all of the um, sort of um, practicalities in our <laughs> in our experiment, right? The thing for all of the imperfections in our experiment, we can we can now correct for, or take it into account in modeling. And in terms of data analysis, we've also gotten much much better since. Um, 15 years ago, the, there were a lot of people already in the 1990s who started developing this uh, and earlier as well. And I think that has really uh, culminated into, uh, into uh, X-ray scattering becoming a very useful technique now. Mm -hmm. However, people don't know about this, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because they, they, uh, they might look at X-ray scattering and go like, oh yeah, no, I, I tried that 20 years ago and it, was, it didn't really match and it was rubbish. So, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, you know, I'm trying to slowly demonstrate that, that no, it actually does make sense or it makes sense now. It may, maybe it didn't make sense in the past, but, uh, but, mm -hmm. but it certainly makes sense to try it now. Definitely, definitely. So, Brian, it sounds to me that you are, and you were also in the past, involved in a lot of really interesting research projects. Um, and now my, my next question is, it's a toughie. Um, if you have to pick one research project that you're most proud of, or the most fun or quirky one, could you pick one? As I said, I know this is a difficult one, but could you pick one and explain it to us in super simple words, please, in the section we call, in other words? Uh, I will do my best. There's one. There's one part which has actually resonated quite well with the uh, with the scientific community, and I was that may be partly due to the partly due to the title of the paper because it was it was called Everything Sucks, mm -hmm. um, and this was a review paper, right? But this was a review paper that combined a lot of very small investigations that I did for my weblog. Uh, mm -hmm. looking at nothing.com mm -hmm. and um, and there there I looked at what uh, what data corrections you could do right uh, all of the data corrections you could do um, now it it used to be that when you looked at data corrections uh, you would have to pick and adapt your data corrections um, based on the system you were investigating and I found this very unsatisfying because it means that if I'm looking at a biological system, I need one set of data corrections. And if I look at a materials investigation, maybe on, on metal alloys or something, I would need another set of corrections. And that doesn't make sense because it's, you know, it, it, in essence, it's the same experiment. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, let me take a step back and let me try and see what is, what possible things I could do to correct my data, right? Mm -hmm. And so I combined all the data corrections that I could think of, and that was about, I think, 21 at a time or something. Um, I think we've come up with two or three more since then. Um, and I put them in the paper and I said, look, these are all the possible corrections you could do. And, uh, and we followed up on that later on uh, and we said, okay, you know, all those possible corrections that you can do, well, you need to do them in the right, in the right sequence, Order. right? So, yeah, yeah exactly. So with, with the help of our colleagues from the Diamond Light Source, we actually implemented that in software and we published a paper saying, okay, those data corrections, uh, you can actually make a single universal data correction method that works for all the samples, at least all the samples that both we and them have thrown at it mm -hmm. um, and gives you really good data without, without any effort because you can do this in an automated fashion. So, so yeah, we, we followed up on that and we made the flow chart saying, okay, these are the, these are the correction steps you want to do. And these are the measurements, the, the measurements that you want to do for that. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that has given us a really powerful tool because now, now we're one step further. Now we don't need to worry about, did I do my data corrections correct when you do the analysis? Because before that you were, you were doing the analysis and things didn't quite fit. And you were like, hmm. Is it the analysis or is my data not correct? You know, let me go one step back and try to subtract a little bit more background or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and you, you you give the users all these sort of little knobs that they can turn and twist and and adjust to get the data which they think is right, but may not be the right data. So we've yeah. wiped that all off the off the table, and we're now we can now say, no, look, this this is the data, um, and this is as correct as it gets. These are the uncertainties. Mm -hmm. Um, and now you go to the analysis and, um, 
if your analysis doesn't work, that means your analysis is not correct. But the data is correct, right? That's that's reliable. I should I, I should hand out these certificates. I was in a I was in a Chinese shop this uh, this weekend, and I saw that they had this. I don't know what it was a a, a box of these um, of these medical supplements that you can take or, or mm-hmm. health health supplements, and that one came with a with a certificate uh, with a picture of somebody saying uh, we certify that we strive to do our best or something like that. <laughs> I, was like, I, I I should do that with my data. Here's, here's the certificate. <laughs> That's that a really was, good idea. Saying yes. that we really did our best. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> right. Wow. Okay. Okay. I can understand why you picked this as for it's one of the research projects that you're most proud of. And might I say, I love the title, Everything Facts. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it is it, so cool. I, I think it's really worked with making the paper a lot, making the paper more popular, right? And that's mm-hmm. so every, every year I also give a give a lecture uh, about um, everything facts. Uh, no, 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 about uh, the dark side of science. Um, oh, you know, uh, research misconduct, uh, things like that, and why research misconduct happens, and you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and part of this is the chase for these metrics and metrics like age index and so on. How do you boost your age index? Well, you make sure you get cited. How do you get cited? Well, you choose really catchy titles for your papers. So definitely, <laughs> definitely. This one, this one was good. Another one that was really good was uh, was by somebody else. Uh, an absolute blast to read. It was. Uh, Will any crap we put into graphene um, imp- improve its electrocatalytic Oh, behavior? I remember <laughs> this. I remember <laughs> this. This was like two years ago, I think. I remember yeah. two years ago. I remember yeah, that's this. Great. And I was like, oh, yes, yes, this is the title. Can yeah. we just make all the scientific papers, <laughs> uh, paper titles, like really catchy and really funny? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, hey, I mean, these are papers that we write, right? And we don't get paid for this. In fact, we need to pay for it. So why can't exactly. we make it a little bit funny, right? So. Exactly. Might as well have some fun with it. Um, yeah. Definitely, definitely. So, um, Brian, it sounds to me that the research aspect of being a scientist is something that you really enjoy. It's close to your heart. Mm-hmm. Uh, but other than the research itself, what else do you like about being a scientist? Yeah, it is. I I'm, I must say it's 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 far from perfect, right? Uh, there is a lot of there is a big guilt feeling that that comes with being a scientist with a permanent contract. Uh, you know, I uh, as I mentioned, I look around at my colleagues and I'm like, oh, they really also deserve. Um, they also really deserve permanent contracts, and they really deserve to be to have some stability in their lives if they want it, right? Mm-hmm. Of course, you know you can always you can always move, and you can always want to move. Um, yeah. So that that's sort of the, the downside of, of of these scientific careers. I also feel really sorry for my for my uh, British colleagues who are who are some, uh, currently suffering from lots of trouble in the academic world when it comes to um, workload as well as uh, pensions being cut, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of trouble going on uh, in science, but you know, every now and then I manage to shut myself in my lab and I have all the toys there, right? Um, right. I, uh, I'm not really lacking in anything. And when I do lack in something, I just go to the basement and I scrounge around and maybe I find something else that I can use. <laughs> Or go to the workshop and ask them to build me that one piece that I'm missing. And uh, and when, when I'm in the lab and I have a and I have a problem setting, I just I go to the shelves, pick one thing, pick another thing, and try and solve that problem in um, in an innovative way that that maybe we didn't uh, we didn't think would work. Mm-hmm. Um, and in that sense, it's it's really important to to remember that you know you can always try you know and. Be, you should expect to fail, right? I mean, right. Um, there were some some cases where I thought, okay, I will try and make a simple version of of of, of this instrument, to, otherwise to, that people would make really complex setups for. Mm-hmm. I was like, I, I will try to make a simple version and see how far I can get with three uh, D printed parts and uh, and uh, uh, cheap bits and pieces and uh, mm-hmm. and then you might find out that it actually works better than you expected. And uh, and that is that is really nice. So I can, um, I mean, maybe it doesn't have a lot of scientific value, but it it certainly gives me the experience 
in building up pieces of equipment and putting stuff together uh, into an integrated system that mm -hmm. um, that later on might help in another project, right? So when mm -hmm. when we get scientists to come to us, we can, uh, and they have a particular question or a particular problem setting or they want to do an experiment where they do a reaction on this side and they need to start it at a particular point and then monitor it um then i can go like okay in that case we can put this together with that together and i've already tried out half of these half of these um, things right and uh, and it's the same whether it's hardware or whether it's uh, software so I, I also write a lot of software and code to analyze people's data um, mm -hmm. I do a lot of different activities. I dabble a little bit in robotics as well. Mm -hmm. um, and all of that uh, playing that you do in the lab, essentially, um, mm -hmm. can at some point come together into, um, into an integrated system that, that can really help one of our colleagues. So, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that's, that's why I always recommend, um, especially uh, students that work with me, uh, to always play. Right. If you have a 3D printer uh, or if you have a laser cutter like what we found in the basement, <laughs> um, <laughs> then don't be afraid to play and use it for printing something, uh, print, printing something that may not have anything to do with your work. Right. The more you mm -hmm. work with these pieces of equipment, the more you try out and the more familiar you get, you get with it. And then next time when you have a scientific problem, you might then go back in your, in your head and go like, oh yeah, no, I can actually use that. And I know how to use it and it won't take much time at all because you know, mm -hmm. you're know you familiar with it. So right. yeah, so right. that all, even though it looks super chaotic, it can actually be uh, uh, super useful in the end, right? Yeah, and it all comes together at the end, the chaos. You do find a Sometimes, story yeah. within the chaos. Yeah. Sometimes, of Sometimes. course, <laughs> of course, of course. So Brian, I mean, you already uh, shared several advices here, but if you were to go back in time and talk to the younger Brian, uh, what ad advice would you would you give him or to the students who are starting their research journey today? What advice, what pieces of advice would you give them? Yeah, I am. So what, what I currently what I currently tell students is that, okay, you know, science is certainly a career it's certainly not an easy career mm -hmm. and the career opportunities are super limited these days so make sure you also look at industry right industry is not the devil that sort of lurks behind and that is uh no that there are many many people on twitter that um that have found themselves very happy changing a career from the scientific world to an industrial world mm -hmm. um and I, I would definitely recommend uh, recommend students and people to keep to keep their options open, keep uh, keep those contacts with industry, uh, try to establish new contacts with industry. I think you'll find that they're actually um, much more amenable than than you might think, right? And, and mm -hmm. you know, you can you can ask for you can ask people for samples. You can ask what they're interested in. Maybe they're interested in what you're doing. You can invite them over. It's super friendly, super helpful. I've certainly had a lot of good contacts with uh, with it, with industry, um, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't hesitate for a second, uh, you know, to 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 switch from um, from the scientific world here in academia to doing uh, to doing science or research uh, for an industrial uh, partner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of the wishes that I would have. Well, uh, oh, um, yeah, um, <laughs> if you have three wishes, what would you ask for? And uh, I'm not promising anything here, okay? Uh, so tell me, tell us about your wishes. Right. Uh, in terms of wishes, I really wish there was, um, there was more stability in science, right? Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, uh, for a scientist to be in their fifth postdoc is incredibly uh, off-putting is, is incredibly downhearting. I mean, and even though I see the the starts of the development of this in uh, in other in other industries, I think the standard still should be that we give people permanent contracts. And if all of the institutes and all of the research environments would give people permanent contracts standard, just like industry does then you wouldn't have to worry about uh, about people staying if they don't like it right if uh, because that's that's not the way it is in industry if somebody doesn't like their work in industry they're not going to stay forever 
they're going to find another job where they will get another permanent contract. So um, as scientists, we've really shot ourselves in the foot there. And <laughs> like, uh, as my wife likes to remind me, she says, yeah, I, I don't know why, why, you, why you did that, because I thought you were supposed to be the smart people. But, uh, <laughs> but that's a very I, good point <laughs> but, but but i don't i don't think so i think i i think you know it's it's just research and researchers are are, are no smarter than than anybody else um but it does make for a funny story <laughs> definitely um, so that's your first wish to have yes, more stability yeah. uh and mm -hmm. longer term contracts for for your colleagues what's yes, your second exactly. wish and the yeah. third wish um, I would really like to see an incre increased diversity in the workplace. Now, it is improving slowly, very, very slowly. Mm. <laughs> and this is, this is something uh, an acquaintance of mine on Twitter explained to me. This is, you know, you don't, you don't have to wait until you get, um, until you get so much diver diversity in the workplace that, that it's all uh, evenly distributed, right? Mm -hmm. this, this is something you can force initially. Mm -hmm. So you can encourage... Um, encourage the hiring of uh, of more diverse people um, if they have the same qualifications and that is something that is certainly a tool that we have um, in our hiring options at the moment mm -hmm. um, so if the qualifications are equal we are we are indeed uh, encouraged to do this and I'm very much a proponent of that um, because I find that that having this diversity in the workplace it really it encourages innovation. I mean, it brings new view, new viewpoints. It brings alternative ideas to the table, um, and that that is super interesting. I, I mean, I'm perhaps lucky in the laboratories that I've worked in and and the laboratories that I've set up that, that we could really push this, and mm -hmm. um, and I think it's really paid off. So I definitely hope that we can that we can increase this uh, dramatically. <laughs> that sounds good. That sounds good. So diversity, increased diversity in the workplace. That's your second wish. What's mm -hmm. your third and last wish? Well, the, that one is a bit of a that one's a bit of a selfish one. I, I mean, I just want to. I, I just find that I'm the happiest when I'm when I'm in the lab, actually actively working on something, and uh, mm -hmm. and I don't have to worry about um, some of the administrative things that I might have to do or meetings that I have to do for. Uh, you know these these things that distract you from what you were actually hired to do. Right? You were hired to do science, not to um, not to fill out uh, fill out forms oh. and things. <laughs> um, and I'm we are relatively lucky in that we have uh, we have a super helpful secretarial staff that uh, that that we can offload a lot of this work to uh, so that we can focus more on science. But there's still a lot of time. A lot of our time wasted in um, in meetings that could have been a lot shorter, or meetings that mm -hmm. could have been a lot more organized, so we get to the point quicker, and we can, you know, we can make a decision and move on, right? <laughs> right. right. Um, so yeah, so my my third wish would be that that we'd really be able to uh, to free up free up our time to do the experiments and the and the developments that we are supposed to do that makes sense all three wishes of yours stable contracts more long-term contracts diversity in workplaces and uh, more focus on science or more time to do the actual science than the bureaucracy um, mm -hmm. all three very very uh, actually i would say realistic wishes i'm not sure about the <laughs> first one um, yes. But yeah, I'm. I'm really. I. I really hope that things will change in the first one. There were some moves by the German government uh, recently to improve this, but I. They might have formulated it in a way that that, that doesn't really work. Yeah, yeah, that doesn't really help. So right. yeah, tricky. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. So this was really amazing, Brian, speaking with you. I really enjoyed our conversation about your science, your life as a scientist. But before I let you go, one last question I have for you. And of course, we cannot record podcasts in 2022 without addressing the giant elephant in every room in on every street corner. And that is the pandemic that we are living mm -hmm. through. Um, so what are your learnings from these uh, challenging times that we are that started about two years ago? Um, yes, um, I did prepare for this question, but I, I I want to change my answer. 
Please go ahead. Change <laughs> this is um, so initially. Uh, initially, I said. I, I, I mean, my answer is still valid. My my answer was, you know, don't wait forever to do what you want to do, and you know, right. make sure you take care of your mental health and find and find or force that balance uh, between life, uh, family, and work. And that 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 is that is so true. But. Um, one of the things we started in 2021, sorry, in 2020 during the pandemic was online lectures. Um, this mm -hmm. online lecture series that I talked about, we were, I think we were one of the earlier ones that, that really started something. And that's because we didn't try to plan everything, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that reminds me of this quote, which, which appeared in the TV series, The Expanse. Uh, now it was attributed to um, Xerxes, <laughs> um, which is, Plan and prepare for every possibility, and you will never act. Uh, it's nobler to have courage as we stumble into half the things we fear than to analyze every possible obstacle and begin nothing. Uh, great things are achieved by embracing, embracing great dangers. Now, I don't think we're doing anything dangerous, but we certainly found that, that, that during the start of the pandemic, uh, we could just do things and we could just try things. And even without a lot of planning, even without a lot of uh, preparation, uh, we can find out how this how this works if it works, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and that was more fun, and it was uh, it was a very very quick development that we could mm -hmm. so go out and play essentially, right? <laughs> yes, I love don't, that. Don't prepare all of these documents. It's it's not necessary. You can just do. <laughs> yeah, go out and play just do it uh no copyright mm -hmm. from any shoe company or anything um on that yes. positive note thank you very much again brian really you're very really welcome forward to having you on real scientist nano thank you mm -hmm. you're welcome oh well, looking forward to curating the the series thank you for listening this is Pranoti, host of Under the Microscope. To know more about us, visit our website, thesciencetalk.com, and follow us on Twitter at realsci_nano.